last DCEU film of the year, Black Adam, has dropped in theaters. So today we're gonna stop and rank every DCEU film plus Peacemaker from the worst to the best. brought to you by Geology. So last year I turned 40 years old and as I quickly approached midlife, I decided I wanted to start taking better care of my body and my skin. So in early 2021, I started using Geology skincare product. Geology is a nine time award winning men's skincare company that creates simple and effective skincare routines custom made just for you. The everyday face wash leaves my face feeling fresh and smooth. I put the repairing night cream on before bed and it keeps my face moist and has some anti-aging ingredients that kind of keep my old man wrinkles away a little longer. And the big one for me was the nourishing eye cream. Now, I've got three kids and a YouTube channel that keep me up late at night and I show a lot of my age in my eyes. The nourishing eye cream fights back against under eye bags and dark circles so I look fresher and younger. Head to geology.com and take their free skincare quiz to save up to 70% off your 30-day trial. You can also join the new Geology Galaxy community for more daily tips, giveaways, and more at discord.gg geology. Thanks again to Geology for sponsoring this video and let's get started. In last place, Justice League. Now when this movie first came out, I thought it was okay. It was great to see the Justice League finally live action on the big screen, but the movie felt clunky. It had this overly processed look to it and had some of the most obvious reshoots of all time. <laughs> but then after the movie's release, the more we learned about everything that went on behind the scenes, this movie just started to feel like one of the most cynical and grossest examples of the studio system. And when I look at this film now, it just looks like someone taking the Mona Lisa and putting bunny ears on it to make it funnier and then changing the color correction to make it brighter so it has a nicer tone and feels a little bit happier. Now I understand that someone had to replace Zack Snyder with him stepping down, but Joss Whedon is not compatible with Zack Snyder on any level and every single change that he made made the film worse. It feels like a Cliff Notes version of a better film because they had a mandated runtime of under two hours. There's a bunch of humor that doesn't mesh with other scenes. Everything about it just feels like it was directed by committee. At best, it's a cobbled together Frankenstein monster but when you realize what really went on behind the scenes, I, I just find this movie to be an abomination. Number 12, Suicide Squad, another victim of whatever was going on with the WB in 2016 and 2017. What's not as offensive as what they did to Zack Snyder, it is an example of the studio just absolutely sabotaging the writer-director David Ayer. He was given six weeks to write the shooting script for the movie, which, not a great plan. Then in post-production, they decided that they wanted the movie to be lighter because of Deadpool and because people responded to one of the trailers with ballroom blitz and queen music playing. So then they brought in the trailer company to rework and re-edit the entire movie and do massive reshoots, rework the entire thing to be more like the trailer and more like Deadpool. And since the release of Zack Snyder's Justice League, David Ayer has been all over Twitter saying that while he did release the movie, he is the director of what was put out. It's not his original vision. It's not the movie he wanted to make. And he would love to be able to release the David Ayer Suicide Squad that was a radically different film, structurally different, much more character based and not so reliant on pop music and rock music for character development. All of that said, I think most of the cast here is actually really good. And so that's what's so frustrating about this movie is that I think they had a fun set of characters. They had a great cast to bring those characters to life. And the basic concept of the Suicide Squad is this dirty dozen inside of the MCU. A great, fun concept. So there's moments that are awesome. There are scenes that are great. There are glimpses of what David Ayer was trying to do. But then you have a movie just absolutely sabotaged by a studio that couldn't stop meddling from beginning to end. Next up, Wonder Woman 1984. And this is a movie that I enjoyed when I first saw it. 
in the theaters. It was the end of 2020. We barely had any blockbusters for nine months. It is a movie that kind of has a bright, uplifting finale. And so I left the theater. I was like, yeah, it's kind of nice to be back in the theater seeing a big blockbuster comic book movie again. But there were also things in it that didn't sit quite right with me. And every day that passed, the more and more I realized, like, whoa, that movie had big, gigantic problems. That movie did not sit well with me. And then on rewatch, the whole thing kind of crumbled and fell apart. Now, I do appreciate some of the homages to the Richard Donner Superman film and, or kind of films. And then there's scenes that I really like. There's a couple moments that are cool. And then it has uses the, the plot device in it to really expose the values of our hero, our two villains. It puts them in conflict with one another. But yikes, this movie is just goes off the rails with some of its ideas that are just so ill-conceived from the idea of Diana hooking up with some random guy who has Steve Trevor's mind put into another person's body. Like, they never even stopped to think about the implications of what that means. You've made a huge mistake. And then whatever goes down in the third act with everyone getting wishes granted and using technology to send out some signal. Wow, this movie just did not work. It did not make sense. And so... It was ambitious. I guess I can appreciate that. Literally, it was the right movie on the right day when I saw it the first time. But it is not a good movie, and it has not aged well at all. As a point of reference, there's a big gap between the bottom three and the rest of this list. Every other movie, I go positive on. Whether they're a movie that I really enjoy, but it's flawed. Whether it's a film that's kind of generic, but also a ton of fun. Or some of these, I just think, are great films. The rest of them, I distinctly, I go positive on them. And as I was making this list, realized like, I really like the DCEU. Bringing us into the top 10, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, the ultimate edition. As a point of reference, I haven't watched the theatrical cut in over five years, so I can't compare the two. So for me, I only really consider the ultimate edition the version of Batman v Superman. And this is a movie I wish that I could put higher up on the list because there's so many things in this movie that I actually really do enjoy. I love that the movie starts off by recontextualizing the end of Man of Steel, letting us see it from the perspective of Bruce Wayne, where he just sees the destruction caused by these aliens coming to Earth. He sees people that he loves suffering, dying, and it pushes him into this extreme state. Likewise, they use Lex Luthor as kind of this counterbalance to Bruce Wayne, where both of them see Superman arrive and they see this threat. And so you see these parallels between these two very rich men and their reactions to Superman. And that makes for a very interesting idea for a setup for a Batman v Superman film. For me, I really enjoy Ben Affleck as Batman, especially as this older, more jaded, more violent version of the character. I've always been a fan of Henry Cavill, so seeing the two of them butt heads is a lot of fun. It's a movie with stakes. It's a movie that's trying to tackle a bunch of ideas. And there is a big part of our problem here. It's so ambitious. It's trying to tackle so many ideas. It's trying to have so many plot lines, so much going on that it gets so convoluted as well. And because we didn't do a Batman movie before this to set up a our this version of Batman, we don't have a point of reference to see anything else about him. So all we know about him is that he's Punisher Batman that brands people and has gone cuckoo for Cocoa Cups and not even Alfred can talk him down from his extremism. And so it's a movie that really would have benefited from having a little bit more setup before we got to this movie, a Batman movie showing him before he goes crazed. And then our mid credit scene for the Batman is the intro of this movie of him watching the end of Man of Steel, setting up this new enraged version of man. What could have been? What could have been? So there's so much in here that I enjoy. Also, I'm pretty sure this is a movie 
that was a victim of the early stages of WB trying to play catch up, trying to micromanage things and push, pushing and rushing to team up movies, pushing and rushing to Justice League. And there's some consequences in this film because of that. But I mean, I love the doomsday fight. I love that there's sacrifices, there's consequences that you have a Bruce Wayne that's dark, but he comes back around. So much I love, but it is a deeply flawed film. Number nine, Aquaman. But to be perfectly honest, the next four movies on this list are all kind of tied. I'd give them all the same score. So Aquaman is number nine, but it's also kind of number six. And this movie is just a lot of fun because James Wan decided just to embrace the inherent silliness of Aquaman, and that's this movie's biggest asset, that's this movie's biggest liability, is that it just goes for it. It's bright, it's colorful. James Wan is cooking with butter and sugar, and what I mean by that is that he's willing to go for like cheap jokes where characters are eating fish out of a fish bowl he, and eating flowers and things like that. It's just really silly humor to put a grin on your face. It has Aquaman doing power poses in the middle of fight scenes with like a guitar stroke. It's just kind of corny. That's its charm. That's its appeal. It's kind of what makes some of it like you roll your eyes at it. It's kind of cringe humor, but it's also kind of fun. At certain points in time in the movie, it just like pop music pops out of nowhere that, you know, disrupts your experience watching the film, but it keeps you engaged at the same time. Where it's like, whoa, we're going to Africa and we're dancing all of a sudden. I mean, it just kind of goes for it from beginning to end. When it comes to the action sequences, it's long takes, it's wide shots with big sweeping action taking place. So it's fun, it's exciting. When there's a chase, you can see everything that's happening. When we have big gigantic battles, they're massive in scope and size. And so it just kind of goes big and broad with everything. Uh, it's not the most original when it comes with, to its plot line. I understand that in the source material that they're, they're pulling from actual comics, but when this movie came out, there's a lot of similarities between this movie and Black Panther, which came out 10 months before. So there's certain plot points in here that are a little bit familiar. Doesn't, you know, make it any less fun to watch it. So uh, a movie that it's not going, trying to be high art. It's not trying to be the best comic book movie of all time. It's trying to be very entertaining. And it is. You'll cringe at some of it, you'll roll your eyes at some of it, but it's fun. Number eight, Birds of Prey and the unbearably long title that I can't remember and which kept changing or simply Harley Quinn. Now this is a movie I've always enjoyed. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And I've never fully understood all the hate that it gets. I have a lot of fun with it, and it feels like a nice, refreshing change of pace in an oversaturated comic book genre of films. Part of the appeal for me is that it is the kind of the smaller scale story. It's street level. It's told non-linear. It's hyperactive. It's kind of like if Guy Ritchie directed a movie inside of the DC universe. It's filled with lively characters. They brought in the John Wick stunt team to do some reshoots to add, to punch up the action so you get a couple of really cool action sequences in the movie. And based off the behind the scenes footage we've seen, Margot Robbie was fully game for all of us and got very involved in just trying to make it as good as possible. And then by having the story being told from Harley Quinn's perspective, she's an unreliable narrator. And so there's parts of it that feel exaggerated and different. It just has an interesting, different, fresh new flavor to it. Once again, it's not a movie that's swinging for the fences. It's not trying to be the biggest and best comic book movie of all time. It's just trying to have fun and do something different. So for me, this movie did that. I had fun with it, so it works for me. And most importantly, it has cocaine. I do cocaine! Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Number seven, Peacemaker, the one DCEU TV series and a show that essentially only came about because of COVID and there was a delay in the production of The Suicide Squad and James Gunn was stuck at home, so he was able to sit there and write this entire show and it turned out to be really good. The starting point of this show 
gave James Gunn the nearly impossible task of trying to make Peacemaker a character that you could root for and like, and somehow he managed to do it. James Gunn is just a master of taking deeply broken characters, people that are not obvious heroes, and making them human, likable, and sympathetic. And the fact that he was able to take Peacemaker on a journey like that after what he did in the Suicide Squad is incredible. The show is funny, it's heartfelt, and it's something new and different inside of this, once again, overly saturated comic book genre, this time period where comic book movies come out all the time, and this is just kind of like a fresh of breath, uh, fre breath of fresh air. And while it can be incredibly crass, it also has like almost this old fashioned wholesome vibe to it because there's just such a sweetness and the way that it kind of treats the friendships that are formed and these little moments that happen where they're taking selfies with each other and the way it can and introduce characters where you don't like them at first. Like, for example, like Vigilante's not introduced as like a great guy. And then you just love the guy by the end of the season. And of course, the most important thing you have to say about the show Peacemaker is that it gave us the catchiest TV show intro in decades. Next up, Black Adam. And to me, this is a superhero B movie. It has a very straightforward plot. It's not very complex. It's heavy on action. It's heavy on humor. It moves very quickly. It aims to entertain, and that's what it does. A lot of people have criticized this movie for feeling like it should have come out 10, 15 years ago, and granted, The Rock has been trying to get this movie made ever since he had hair. Here I am. And I'd agree with the observation that this does feel like a comic book movie that could have come out 10 or 15 years ago, but I don't think that that's a criticism. Not every comic book movie needs to be an epic, complex deconstruction of something involving the genre or heroes themselves. Some of them just aim to be crowd pleasers, and that's what this movie was for me. It finds a way to kind of tell a liberation story about a town. It introduces the Justice Society that just gets some great moments in it. Of course, Pierce Brosnan is awesome as Dr. Fate. But I also love the rivalry between Black Adam and Hawkman. And just finds all sorts of ways to tie into like four different DCU properties while also telling a standalone story. So for me, this movie was exactly what I hoped it would be, which is kind of a blast. It's not great cinema. It's not deep. It's not a great character study. It's just a lot of fun. But honestly, like I said, when talking about Aquaman, numbers nine through six on this list are kind of interchangeable. Any day of the week, they could be in a different order. And I probably have a bias towards the one I watched most recently, which was Black Adam. Number five, Shazam. One part superhero movie, one part big, one part family drama. And all of it much better than I was expecting, and largely because of Zachary Levi being the perfect person to bring the title character to life. Now, I went into this movie expecting Zachary Levi to do a good job of playing an adult superhero with the mind of a child. What I wasn't expecting was just how heartfelt this movie was actually going to be. At its core, it really is a movie about family. And it spends a lot of time making you care about Billy and this family that he finds and being on a journey with both Billy as the kid and the person, as well as him trying to be the superhero in this wild, crazy adventure. And there are just some gut-wrenching scenes in this movie, and it packed so much more emotion than I was expecting. And all of that made it so it could have a third act that does something that should be extraordinarily cheesy, and perhaps it is, but it works and it pays off so well when you get the Shazam family showing up to save the day at the end. They earned that finale. 
Of course, the other thing you have to talk about with this movie is it's really funny. Zachary Levi, as mentioned before, is just perfect as this man-child with superpowers, and they find every fun opportunity that you want from that setup. It's a movie, I, you know, I, I kind of want to put it higher up on the list, but I think it does have some tonal issues, and it has some issues in kind of targeting its audience where there's a couple scenes where all of a sudden we're in a horror movie and there's demons throwing guys out windows and eating them alive. You go, whoa, that does not mesh with some of the silly kid humor that we also have going on in this film. And so if they, they leveled some of that stuff out. I might have even had this one higher up on the list because I was just so entertained by the superhero stuff in the comedy but it also has so much heart. In fourth place, The Suicide Squad, the second James Gunn project on this list that came about simply because of unusual circumstances that created an opportunity. Disney fired James Gunn from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 for like six months because of resurfaced 10-year-old tweets that were jokes in bad taste. Therefore, WB snatched him up and he ended up directing a Suicide Squad movie, and in my mind, it was just a perfect pairing of a director's skill set with the right property. If you don't, if you're only familiar with James Gunn's comic book movie adaptations, you might not realize, like, his background is doing, like, trauma movies, and then he did this movie called Super. He has a really dark sense and mean-spirited sense of humor. Hence why he was fired by Disney for a brief window of time. And taking that side of him, plus his incredible ability at telling stories about broken characters and putting them together into teams that brings about their humanity, he's just the perfect person to tackle something like the Suicide Squad, especially if you'll let him make it R-rated and that's what this movie was. Kind of the best of James Gunn and what he can do and bring to the table where you get a group of villains sent on this mission and he finds a way to find the humanity in even the weirdest of characters. Even King Shark has little emotional moments. Even just characters that are just, just relentlessly bleak and angry, there's some thing in that character that feels human. And so he can make this ultra-violent movie with a dark, dark sense of humor, also very heartwarming and kind of about friendship and family at the exact same time <laughs> that we're like having King Shark rip people in half. Also, as I mentioned here a few times, it's another movie that's a bit of a breath of fresh air inside of an oversaturated genre because it has all the stuff that you want from a comic book movie with the big wild characters, gigantic action sequences, but it's also an homage to 60s and 70s war movies, in particular, The Dirty Dozen. And not just in concept form like the original Suicide Squad, but in the way that it plays out, it very much has the vibe of the Dirty Dozen, while not being like The Dirty Dozen at all, very much feeling like a James Gunn film. So a movie that I'm just so glad that it exists. It's so entertaining, it's heartfelt, it has awesome action, and it came about because Disney fired him over 10-year-old jokes that were in bad taste. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comments section, share your ranking of all 13 DCEU films and TV show. My list is in the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. Also, I've done a ton of DCEU content going all the way back to 2016. You can check it out in this playlist right up here. I've ranked everything that you can imagine. I've talked about it from every angle, and I will have more videos coming over this next week as I do my 2022 updates over the next week. In third place, Wonder Woman. Now, this is a project that I openly said I didn't think would work prior to its release. Just the idea of an Amazonian superhero that flies around in an invisible jet, swings a magic lasso, and is in a skimpy dress that looks like a US flag is a tough sell. It's not the easiest concept to adapt into live action, and I didn't have a vision for how they could do it. And 15 years ago, Joss Whedon tried to adapt it before he did Avengers, and he failed to pull it off. But this is why I talk about movies and don't make movies. And Patty Jenkins 
cracked the code on how to do it and take the character and make her strong, powerful, likable, but also human. And it was just such a cool movie that was able to do so many different things. It's a movie that has big, awesome action. It has humor inside of it. And it's able to have Diana be this strong woman, but she also comes off maternal. They can do fish out of water comedy with her where she does very silly things, but never compromising the integrity of the character. They have moments that are just really empowering and inspiring when she walks through no man's land. That's all these gigantic things. It's able to do all of that, but also it's able to tackle ideas about man's inhumanity to man organically and feel right. The character of Wonder Woman as this outsider stepping into World War I, a war that wasn't as clear as who was right and who was wrong. It wasn't like World War II where it's very easy to go, those are the bad guys. And because of that, it's able to tackle these interesting philosophical ideas and have it tie to our lead character's character arc. When the action happens, it's thrilling, visceral, stylized, exciting. And then they bring Steve Trevor in, who's a great compliment to Wonder Woman. It doesn't do anything to cheapen either character. Each of them grows because the other is in their life. They have amazing chemistry with one another. There's all sorts of funny bits behind, all sorts of things that happen between the two of them. You buy into the romance and what they see in one another, and they never have to cheapen either one of them to make all of this happen. It's great for two acts, and unfortunately, it doesn't quite sustain that throughout the third act. It gets very talky, and then it goes into full-blown CGI spectacle mode, and so just the elements don't really come together with what they do in the third act. And throughout interviews over the last several years, Patty Jenkins has said that the studio kind of mandated that they needed to do have a more spectacular third act with more CGI and more action to it that led to somewhat what's in there. And so she kind of agrees with the criticisms, but I think it also makes it clear that they never really had the best ending for this movie in mind when they went into production. So a movie that's almost at the top of this list and then doesn't quite land the invisible plane. Our runner-up, Man of Steel, and I was so excited when this movie came out. I was actually a youth pastor at the time, and it opened while I was on a trip, but I still had to see it opening night, so I took all of the seniors and did it as a senior sneak. We went to a midnight showing. I bought their tickets, popcorn, soda, all that fun stuff, just because I had to see it opening night. Because that's what heroes do. And when I first watched it, I was very mixed on the film. I grew up on the Christopher Reeves Superman films. I had them on a VHS tape and they meant so much to me. They're such a gigantic part of why I love superhero movies. And Zack Snyder did this radical reimagining of everything that I knew and loved about Superman. But every time I rewatch this movie, I like it more and I see something in it that I missed initially. Zack Snyder brings his unique visual style, his style of action, and his perspective on heroes to the world of Superman and gives us this Clark Kent that's torn between two worlds, trying to find his place and what his mission is in life. And we see that journey play out as he discovers his origins in this film. And we see him as Superman on day one, having to literally fight back against the Kryptonians as they arrive. The score is absolutely phenomenal. Hans Zimmer had the nearly impossible task of trying to follow up John Williams' Superman score, which is very arguably the best superhero score of all time. And Hans Zimmer was absolutely, absolutely up for the challenge and delivered something totally different for Superman, but fit this version. And it it's perfectly fits this version as John Williams' version fit Christopher Reeves' film. Henry Cavill was born to play this version of the character in the star-making performance that here we are almost 10 years later and people have been demanding they give us a sequel. And as of this week, 
it looks like it's actually going to happen. But coming in at number one is Zack Snyder's Justice League, a superhero epic that was almost lost to time due to bizarre studio politics. But then because of fan demand, a new streaming service needing original content, and a pandemic creating a window of opportunity, it actually got completed and released. And when I went into this watching it the first time, I was expecting it to be better than Justice League, but probably something in line with Batman v Superman. An ambitious but very flawed film. And then I watched it, and I was just blown away at how good it actually was. Zack Snyder, he did it. He pulled it off. You did it. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. And when you've seen Zack Snyder's vision for this film, it makes it even more confusing as to what on earth were they thinking with Justice League because every single change they made made the movie worse. It was designed to be this long superhero epic that takes its time to set up its characters and its plot points. There's time with each character to understand their backstory, their motivation, the journey that they're on. And because we have plenty of runtime, we can set up each plot point and earn every moment. As we move into the back half and everything starts to be paid off, it's so satisfying because you've been on this gigantic journey with these characters. And as things happen, you piece together this complex web of plot points, character choices, and actions that come together to create these awesome, awesome moments. Because the movie's so big and so epic, Every character gets a moment in the spotlight and to shine, and you get these great lines of dialogue. I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells. He's never fought us. Not us united. As you're watching the film, you're piecing everything together. And so when the music swells up as you realize where it's heading, it's so powerful. It's so satisfying. And it's so bizarre, the changes that they made, especially as you move into the third act. And you had this finale where the world is being destroyed and the Flash turns around and turns back time, rebuilding reality to undo what's been done to save everything. It's one of the most epic moments in all of superhero film that we've ever gotten. One of the most epic moments. And they replaced it with The Flash Pushes a Car. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Unbelievable. It's crazy what they did. But because of the way the universe played out, Zack Snyder got to complete his epic. And I thought it was fantastic. It was so much better than I thought it was going to be. And it's actually a great superhero film. So it comes in at number one. Remember, I've done more DCEU content like this. You can check it out in this playlist right up here. And I got more rankings coming up over the next few days. Also, if you're looking to take good care of your skin, I've got that link for geology down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.